uh, 6,000 where we are now is only yeah. really 50%. So six to seven is, is really not, it's not that outrageous of a reach. Um, of course, it's a highly optimistic scenario. And let's, let's hope everything that's in place right now that's gotten us this far remains in place. I want you to consider the, the really big things. And of course, uh, best in debt treasury is great. Deregulation is great. All of these new stories. But the actual current fundamentals are the reason we are where we are. The 10 year is now 430. It hit 445 on 1113, and it's been backing off ever since. You actually have an inversion again in the 10 year, two year. There were a lot of people on their dance card who had marked off 5% 10 years going to be yeah, trouble for the right. market. Those people, they're not talking, they're not talking this week. Um, you have <laughs> earnings growth. Earnings growth continues, and it's coming from eight out of the 11 sectors. So, and, it's, and, and by the way, the number one performing sector on the year is financials, not tech. So we're going to lose that MAG7 narrative shortly as well. The S&P 500 banking sector hit new all-time highs this morning. For yeah. the S&P diversified banks, the whole sector, median RSI is 70. All five of the big banks are above both moving averages. Um, Bank of New York, JPM, BAC, Citi, and, uh, and Wells Fargo. Um, that's what's leading the market. The median return in the S&P financials is 41%. It's almost every stock. It's impossible not to find one that's working. So a lot of narratives are being shattered. If these pieces stay in place, earnings growth, rates falling, longer term rates falling too, deregulation, like what, what else would you be looking for to get to 7,000? What more would you possibly need? I, I think one of the, one of the things that, it, it, one of the exercises that's worth doing is looking at individual stocks. Even if you're uh, a sector investor or an index investor, um, or you have some sort of bias to cap size because you're a professional and your universe is SMID or whatever, you still should understand what's happening with stocks. We keep a list called the best stocks in the market. And when you look at the names that are uh, on that list, I'll just tell you the names that were added at the end of last week, as of the Friday close. Joe, there's no rhyme or reason or continuity between these names. It's coming from every sector. It's Palantir, but it's also Starbucks. It's General Motors, but it's also Zoom. It's Home Depot but it's also BlackRock. And so in that kind of an environment, it's less punishing to miss, to your point, to miss those mag seven. You could, you could be in any sector right now, just about, with very few exceptions, any industry group, and if you own a name that's got a market cap that's 50 to 100 billion and is a profitable company, it probably has a great chart. And the funds rate is very high relative to a lot of the incoming information. In a recent discussion, economists and market strategists weighed in on the Federal Reserve's actions and the broader economic outlook. David Kelly, chief global strategist at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, argued that the Fed should have started cutting interest rates earlier. He believes earlier rate cuts would have helped normalize monetary policy without causing market panic, especially since inflation was trending back towards 2%. He compared current unemployment rates to those of the 1990s, a period of strong growth and low inflation. Zervis acknowledged that while unemployment has risen slightly, it doesn't signal excessive slack in the labor market. He attributed recent market volatility to a mix of geopolitical tensions, changes in Japanese monetary policy, and currency market fluctuations. Zervis also noted that August's reduced market liquidity could exacerbate these issues. Stephanie Roth, chief economist at Wolf Research, suggested that recent market swings are partly due to seasonal factors. She noted that a few months ago, there were concerns about an overheating economy and high interest rates, but now the situation has reversed. Roth pointed out that despite a recent softer job report, 114,000 jobs added, this is still above historical averages and that inflation is below 2.5%. She concluded that the current economic indicators suggest stability, and the market's reaction might be overblown, driven more by short-term narratives than fundamental issues. Tom Lee explained this rotation very simply. Small caps are breaking out and will rally 40% as the S&P 500 sputters, Fundstrat's Tom Lee said. He added compared to names backing the S&P 500, stocks in the Russell 2000 tend to be more rate-sensitive. That makes higher interest rates a challenge for the index, but it rally when borrowing costs finally edge down. 
I think that August is really going to be one where the rotation becomes more evident, and I think it's going to be stronger small caps and maybe flat, just slightly down for the S&P," Lee said. In fact, when the Russell 2000 last rallied around 30% in the final months of last year, large caps had similarly sputtered," Lee said. Given how oversold small caps are today, the rotation could be even more sizable this time around," he added. Kevin Gordon from Schwab discussed the recent market volatility, particularly focusing on the impact of a single job report and its disproportionate effect on market behavior. He noted that investors are questioning whether this volatility is due to a shift in market positioning or genuine recession fears. Gordon emphasized that the market's reaction to minor economic data and the Federal Reserve's policy timing reflects a broader issue of frothy investor sentiment and technical positioning. The recent rapid market movements, including a sharp drop in megacap stocks and small-cap volatility, are attributed to this overextended sentiment and underlying market weaknesses. Additionally, the debate now centers on whether the Fed should cut rates by 25 or 50 basis points, a decision that could further influence market stability and investor anxiety. Gordon highlighted that the market's increasingly volatile nature and delayed reactions, especially in small caps, are creating significant uncertainty. Kevin Gordon discussed Nvidia's significant drop, noting that it fell 25% from its recent highs over a month and a half with no new fundamental news. This sharp decline highlights the increased volatility in the market. Gordon pointed out that Nvidia's steep drop is part of a broader trend where markets are reacting more violently to news and technical factors. This volatility is exacerbated by rapid market movements and frothy investor sentiment. He mentioned that such extreme swings in stock prices, like Nvidia's, underscore the general instability and heightened sensitivity in today's market environment. This trend reflects broader market patterns where technical and sentiment-driven factors are causing large and abrupt price changes. As we approach November, it's important to keep political commentary in check, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on. The original aim of the rule was to streamline fiscal policy and mitigate political influence during economic downturns. Although that goal might seem idealistic now, it's crucial to avoid panicking. There are unique aspects to the current situation, but the rule was designed to take preventive actions to cushion the impact of economic downturns. At the moment, we aren't in a critical phase, so there is still room for maneuver. This should encourage discussion and focus on the labor market, which is central to economic health and growth finally, regarding job levels, as you noted in your recent Substack post, the decrease is more significant than during most recessions. If we see continued weakness in the upcoming jobs report and CPI figures before the next Fed meeting, what are the chances of the Fed responding outside of their scheduled meetings? Policy changes outside of scheduled meetings are rare and usually occur only in response to major financial disruptions or crises. While there's always a possibility, significant macroeconomic shifts alone are unlikely to prompt an immediate Fed response. The current message isn't one of crisis but rather a call to address ongoing issues. It's crucial to communicate this clearly to the we're currently facing a major warning of a potential market crash. The economy seems to be on the brink of a downturn, and we're already seeing stock prices fall and unemployment rates rise sharply. This poses a significant concern for anyone holding assets, be it stocks or real estate, as their values might be on the verge of a severe decline if the economic situation continues to deteriorate. The latest jobs report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that the unemployment rate has jumped to 4.3 percent, up from 3.3 percent last year. This represents a 100 basis point increase, and more alarmingly, there are now over 7.2 million unemployed Americans, a 21 percent increase from the previous year. Historically, such a sharp rise in unemployment has often been a precursor to a recession, with worsening conditions following. I mention this not to alarm you, but to present the facts about the current economic landscape. If you've been following my channel, this news may not come as a surprise. Over the past two years, there were many who argued that a recession was unlikely or that the economy was in good shape. However, as we observed rising consumer debt and increasing credit card defaults, it became clear that the economy was not as robust as some claimed. Now, this reality is reflected in the government's job data. My primary concern is the stock market, which is currently in a significant bubble. For instance, the S&P 500 is trading around 5,500 to 5,400 today, and its valuation, at over 30 times earnings, echoes the conditions seen during the 2021 pandemic bubble and the 2000 dot-com bubble. These are two of the only instances when stock prices have been this inflated, suggesting a potential crash. A rising unemployment rate and more Americans on the unemployment line could further harm the stock market by reducing consumer spending and consequently lowering corporate earnings. 
We're already seeing warnings from companies like McDonald's, Amazon, and Intel about declining consumer demand and slowing sales. As for the housing market, the impact of a rising unemployment rate and a possible recession is complex. Higher unemployment generally dampens housing demand, as fewer people are willing to take on large mortgages. Additionally, job losses often force people to sell their homes, contributing to an increase in housing inventory. For example, in Shore Acres, Florida, housing inventory has surged by 400% over the past three years, reaching its highest level in a decade. For those looking to buy or sell homes, or even renters hoping to buy in the future, it's crucial to consider current home equity levels. Homeowner equity in the U.S. is at an all-time high, exceeding $25 trillion. While high equity means many homeowners could absorb price reductions without losing money, it also means there's significant potential for price drops, particularly in markets where prices are already inflated. In the past three years, inventory has surged by 400%, resulting in the highest number of homes for sale in a decade. For those interested in buying, selling, or renting with the future goal of purchasing, it's crucial to understand the current state of home equity. According to the Federal Reserve, homeowner equity in the U.S. has reached a record high of over $25 trillion. This means many homeowners have substantial equity built up, largely due to the market's performance over the last 15 years. Because of this high equity, sellers can afford to lower their home prices significantly without facing financial loss. Even with a price reduction of 15 to 20 percent, most homeowners would still profit from their initial purchase, especially those who bought property before the last couple of years. This situation creates significant potential for price drops, particularly in markets that are currently overvalued. Areas with the highest inventory and price cuts are particularly vulnerable to declines. Using tools like the Reventure app, you can identify which cities and zip codes are most exposed to potential price drops. Notably, many of these areas are in the South and Mountain West regions, where prices are already falling and may continue to do so. Turning to the broader economy, there's ongoing debate about whether we're headed for a recession. Some experts downplay the recent rise in unemployment, suggesting it's merely a normalization of the labor market. Jerome Powell, head of the Federal Reserve, has characterized the current unemployment rate and claims as part of the economy's adjustment, with a view that it may not worsen significantly. However, historically, a rising unemployment rate often signals a worsening economy. When unemployment spikes significantly year over year, it can trigger a recession, as decreased consumer spending leads to further job losses and economic downturns. While it's not guaranteed that this pattern will repeat, the combination of a historically overvalued stock market, the most overvalued housing market ever, and rising unemployment suggests that a downturn is possible. To safeguard against potential market declines, consider holding cash. Treasury bills currently offer over 5% returns, which outpaces inflation and provides liquidity for future opportunities. While it's not glamorous, maintaining cash reserves can be a prudent strategy in uncertain times. This doesn't mean selling all your stocks, but ensuring some cash on hand can allow you to take advantage of opportunities as they arise, particularly in real estate markets where prices are expected to drop further you get paid to play the game, and there's only one game in town.